Hello, we're back. Um, the so we had the start another call. But um, hopefully, a lot of what Taro was saying at the end there was caught. Um, we were talking about protecting dreams, and I think that's where it froze. Mm -hmm. um, well, from what you were talking, from what I heard, I heard a good chunk of it. I started thinking, too, about um, asking you just to kind of describe your journey to your work and how you kind of came interested, particularly in the vein of um, steering away from, I guess, mainstream ways of uh, dream work. Or, and I thought about this because when you were talking about um, being careful about what practice you do and like um, being careful about who you learn from. I thought about how things go with colonization and capital, capitalism especially, and how a lot of things get co-opted. And so when people are being introduced to, an, usually because of, I guess, the way marketing goes, what's right in front of you and what's easily accessible is like the big corporation or like the big wellness center, you know, for um like the roots so just curious about your journey and if you have any particular um like message about making sure that people find the source that will be most beneficial to them yeah so <clears throat> in terms of my journey i have always been a very vivid dreamer and when I was a kid, I would always, I would use my dreams as divination before I even knew what divination was. In particular, I would use it as, I knew I had a crush on somebody when I had a dream about them. That was like, my, one of my like go-to things about dreaming when I was a kid. Um, some of the other types of dreams that I had were kind of scary to me because they were so real. And sometimes they were about a scary situation. So for a long time, you know, I disregarded my dreams and I was like, oh, that's not, you know, whatever, it's not, it's not important, etc. And it wasn't until I had had like a, a very, like a, a very intense series of unfortunate events and I was dealing with PTSD symptoms and that was when I was like okay I can't I can't ignore these dreams anymore I really have to figure out a way to get a better handle on them because at this point these dreams are preventing me from sleeping through the night and so um, at that time I had decided um, so I needed a rest from all the stuff that was going on in my life so I had decided to accept my partner's offer to come to California and like spend some time in the desert with him and his family um, and so I did I didn't necessarily know where to start that was what year was that that was like that was 2017 so Trisha of the NAP ministry had, you know, was out there, was starting to do her work. So I'll, that was like kind of where I started um, with like going through some of the research materials that she had shared, listening to different interviews that um, she had done that explained some of her journey. So I guess like that was the first step, you know, I went to somebody who was black, you know, I went to somebody who was from where my dad is from she's from chicago my dad is from chicago too so i like i felt a call toward her work because of the affinities that we share and the location space that we share um and as i started you know looking into her work and like reading um the book by matthew walker who really talks about like the science behind how sleeping helps folks heal from the impacts of trauma you know, it's so necessary for us to be to be sleeping, to get, be getting at least eight hours, etc. Um, so while I was like, you know, during the day I was doing those types of things, and then at night I um, was being reminded of these stories 
from the land from the landscape and it was it was as if there was like an old grandmother who wasn't from my lineage was definitely from the lineage of the landscape of the desert where i was at um would come to me at night and would tell me about how to position my body so that i could sleep through the night and uh um you know, and for for me i was sleeping very like balled up trying to protect myself and like kind of like on my side balled up and she would have me lay down flat on my back and so this part of my body was like open and spread out and she was like don't bend your legs you know keep everything straight and she was like demonstrating how energy can flow through my body like this and all of it needs to be straight so things are not getting stuck and she was talking about all of the like all of the bizarre angles that my body was at was making it more difficult for me to stay asleep through the night. Um, so so I tried that and that that helped, you know, to get the to for me to fall asleep. Um, I was still experiencing this like falling sensation while I was sleeping. Um, and the thing that finally allowed me to so I also had studied herbalism for about three years before this with a black herbalist. And so I was experimenting with like just having different plants by me as I was sleeping. Um, so the, the mixture of plants that ended up working for me was uh, a cannabis oil with a lemon balm oil with a, a citrine crystal sitting on top of it. And then I had that plate um, like above my head while I was sleeping and that that's what like that really moved the nightmares away um, And in the, in that process I was also you know cleaning the room and you know turning the TV off earlier and all of those types of things um, And I hadn't been sleeping you know for months um, And for me to have just spent like you know deciding that I wanted to like you know get a handle on these dreams um, you know, figure out how I could be able to sleep because I was waking up like screaming like it was like not pleasant at all um, and yeah using the plants you know having one of the spirits of the land like come to me with like instructions about how to lay my body and then from there it made me realize that in some of the classes where i was teaching about herbs but we weren't ingesting any herbs we were just having the herbs by us was also the beginning of how i was teaching people about dreams and teach and thinking about dreams as if I'm a farmer. A dream is something to plant, a dream is something to nourish, a dream is something that has a seed, you know, that can become a tree, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and you know, combi combining all of the, the research that I had done, and I also started making songs. Like I said, I make lullabies. So I started collecting all of these sounds from the from the landscape, the sounds of the birds and the helicopters and the wind moving through the trees and creating these uh, 10 15 minute long sound collages or like this landscape of sound and then I was singing over it and doing poetry over it so I started teaching people about dreams by performing these songs in public while while also giving people all of these different examples of well, methods that I had collected around herbs to sleep with, around uh, ways that you can start to interpret your dreams using tarot cards or using the stories or like looking toward the quilts of your ancestors and the stories of the quilts of your ancestors as like part of your understanding of your dreams. Um, so I was teaching, so I started teaching in Tucson, which is another city in the desert. And um, so I, I was doing those classes as two-day classes where people could um, dream in between. So we would do some work with water and doing like some clearing and cleansing work with water and bird feathers that I had uh, similar to some practices that I learned while I was in Ecuador. Um, uh, when I was receiving my Pachacuti Mesa initiation. Um, and then, you know, just sitting, you know, sitting in a circle um, with other black and brown folks, like 
you know, telling stories. Like I, I had an agenda and like an outline of the things that I was sharing, but I was also making uh, making a space for people to share their stories. So I would talk a lot the first day and then I would perform at night in between. And then on the second day, uh, was was for people to share stories. So I should share the story of what happened last night after they did the ritual. Share, um, you know, so people will bring in things like bring in a family quilt and talk about the story of the quilt. Um, and and then what happened after that? I kept teaching. I kept teaching about dreams. So I probably was like teaching in like pop up spaces for a couple years. And then I got connected to Jen the Rainmaker, who teaches the traditions of her lineage, which are Toltec Chichimeca dream traditions. And those traditions are generally or historically like over the course of 50 years and only taught to the to the warriors of of the community. And so as a larger there has been a larger prophecy around a period of time where the world would need their dream practices and so where they would be allowed to share the practices outside of um outside of their you know outside of their family outside of their communities and so jen is a a wisdom keeper and a faith keeper of these traditions and is teaching them um so i went this was last summer i went to study with jen in hawaii and I was really looking for um, a, a pathway to figure out how to really deeply learn um, the dream practices and traditions of my, of my own lineage. And as I, I was doing that, I had already been collecting stories. So at some point, I needed to transition from the, all of the in-person workshops into a, a remote way of working. Um, in terms of like sustainability and I, I was experiencing some burnout and it's so funny to be a rest worker or a dream worker and then not be getting enough rest um, while trying to tell other people about rest. Um, so I, I had experienced burnout and I was like, okay, I have to figure out a totally different way to do this because it's not sustainable for me to be, you know, bouncing around the country all the time time and it's a, it's a lot of energy to like be bringing these you know ancient traditions and explaining all of these things to small groups of people um so i transitioned my whole business to be completely remote and to and i figured out how to teach people you know these traditions um through through videos through songs through storytelling through pdfs etc um so last 2019 i was i spent a lot of last year you know setting up that infrastructure and, and i'm now continuing to grow it this year um but working with jen last year was like very very impactful to have someone who had you know was a little bit older than me and had already like spent all of this time really figuring out a way to and, and her 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 traditions are taught to her orally as well she's not given protocols and pdfs and stuff like that she had to do that work to um, translate it into a way that other people could learn it without necessarily the time it takes to like sit and listen to the stories. Um, so she's like such a valuable resource. You know, she's such a great teacher, and in the ways that she has, you know, really created these really beautiful frameworks for learning these these traditions. Um, so I can continue teaching after that and, you know, her and I had had some conversations about, okay, once you learn from someone else who has traditions that are different from yours, even if they may have parallels, how are you making sure that you're staying in good relationship and, you know, sharing things that are yours to share? Um, because if one has like, you know, taken a couple of classes with someone, you don't necessarily know the ins and outs. You don't necessarily know like what protective methods like they're doing for the group. You don't know the, you don't know the behind the scenes. You don't know necessarily all of the stories about why they're doing things the way that they're doing. So we had some conversations about, you know, the types of information that it would be safe for me to share and the types of information for me to, you know, refer folks to Jen to study with her directly. Um, 
And like I said, uh, you know, my intentions were with like studying with Jen was to really open up. I was like, I went to Jen being like, I really want to know and understand African traditions around dreaming. Um, so, so, and essentially with a lot of these traditions, uh, indigenous and African traditions, the first step in being able to teach is to do the self-healing work like within yourself first. And so a lot of Jen's traditions are about clearing out what's in the way for you to manifest what you need in your life and what you want in your life. So while you're sleeping, you are creating your your waking reality. So everyone you in her traditions and every everyone that you've ever met, you've dreamed them before. And so it's about clearing out the things that are you know that our barbs, our, our snares, our traumas, etc. Clearing those things out so that you have a more open path and a more open flow for the things that you are trying to like call to you. Um, and so for me, you know, that was really it was really about like a lot of the projects that I'm working on this year. You know, pulling together um, an anthology, pulling together some of these oral stories in a way that we have, you know, more of the word that is coming to my mouth is a Bible, a Bible of our our dreams and the ways, the many, many, many different ways that we have interacted with our dreams across time. Um, and like as, as a reference and a, as a, a tool of inspiration for people to um, start to value their dreams in a different way. Uh, especially because for those of us who have grown up in the United States and who have maybe grown up around uh, a dominant culture or have grown up around a lot of white people or a lot of Europeans, etc., um, where kind of a particular type of logic is what is privileged, you know, we may need to combat or move through uh, the ways that like believing in your dreams is a superstition or that's fake or whatever. Um, so to have you know a variety of folks who are from a lot of different professional backgrounds, um, you know, really speaking about the ways that they, you know, they have interacted with their dream medicine and that this this is something that they value and something that gives um, insight into the things that they're experiencing and gives insight into their creative projects and gives insight of how to, you know, make money uh, and to survive and navigate through the all these different landscapes that we have to navigate through. Um, yeah, and so that's you know that's what I that's what I'm working on, and like it also on a, on a spiritual level, you know, I was doing a lot of clearing work in my own lineage, and you know, healing relationships with my family for a while. I was estranged from my family; I wasn't talking to any of them. Like now, I talk to my parents like a few times a week. Um, that has been like one of the the biggest things. And you know, when I was talking about the series of unfortunate events, those were very like serious things: domestic violence, um, you know, some things around addiction things like that like I have made very very serious and um, very beautiful progress in my own healing journey through paying attention to my dreams and making sure that I am getting enough rest to be able to dream and really setting up my life to be able to dream like you know switching from working jobs to working for myself so that I can set my own schedule um, switching from reminding myself that it's important to me like the aesthetics of my home is is very important to me um, and so to and then and then also I also became initiated as a sangoma which is a South African traditional healer um, and that dreams are a huge part of that medicine. Dream interpretation is a huge part of that medicine. And so, like I was saying earlier, when you asked about how does it compare to other spiritual traditions, and I really see dreams as like this umbrella. Um, for me, the Sangoma initiation was very much the umbrella for all of the other things that I have been studying for the for the herbalism, for the energy healing and the Reiki attunements and for the Pachakuti Mesa and for the conjure practices for all of that, the Sangoma was very much the umbrella. 
understanding um, of you know what I what I'm here to do, and what I'm here to do is to lead folks through lead folks through darkness and to really start to understand themselves and folks in their lineage as God, as these generators, operators, distributors, you know, these creators of their life and of their reality. And so I think in terms of folks finding a teacher um, and like kind of things to think about as you're looking for a teacher is think about who you are and what type of person resonates with you. So for me, I, I am of African descent. I am of indigenous to Turtle Island, Afro-native descent. I'm queer. I'm trans, um, and so those are the types of people who I'm looking for to teach me because I know that they have lived experience that overlaps with some of the experiences that I've had. And to be a dream worker is very much a, a dream worker or a dream warrior is very much a, it's a very integrated experience. It's not something that you're only doing nine to five, Monday through Friday, even though I do have open hours and when I'm working, um, I also am very much living this. Um, and to really learn these practices, you have to live it. And so it's not really, it's not something you probably shouldn't learn from somebody who has a hobby for them. Um, it should probably be someone who's like very immersed immersed in it and because of, because there's also so much to learn about it like our, our dream landscapes are so big and so varied and also very connected to history and all these things that have happened and very connected to plant medicines and ethnobotany and there it's, it's just such a huge possibility of, of information to comb through and sift through so there's always so much to learn uh, so I'm always learning. I'm always taking more classes. I'm always figuring out more elders to study with. I'm always I'm always studying with my my spirits who I work with. And I'm and I'm always you know doing the documentation. Like every morning when I wake up, I'm writing down my dreams, and then I'm also like you know flipping back to see what I dreamed this week, what I dreamed this month. Um, sometimes I'll be going back six months and things like that. So yeah, I really, I'm really excited for more people to find their their dream teachers because it's such powerful and potent medicine and like really connects us to who we are. Yeah, it sounds like a feedback. <laughs> um, recording is so funny, but like everything goes wrong. But I wonder, um. Just we're almost at about an hour and I want to be like respectful of your time. I wonder with everything you said, um, if you could talk a little more about the blocks that people experience when, and I guess this kind of wraps everything together when you were talking about cleaning in the beginning and clearing and um, making sure that that foundation is there. And then you also talked about um, what you learned from Jen the Rainmaker and creating this path that um, doesn't have blocks in it. So um, I guess just like top three things, <laughs> I had to make it like very like Daily Mail or like, you know, Board Panda-esque, but <laughs> if you could just give me like three things that people usually say are like their biggest blocks or maybe what your biggest blocks were? Like, what are the hard things to get rid of just so people are aware of, like, this is going to be really tough if you're trying to, you know, tackle this thing? So I will say that in general, folks who are coming to me are experiencing some type of mental slash emotional distress. Uh, and that's really where my focus and expertise lies. So, top three things, um, maybe nightmares would be a thing, you know, some type of really scary dream, you know, a recurring dream of an ex, things that people would consider nightmares, not remembering people, not remembering dreams at all, and just feeling like blocked and blank or disassociative. Uh, and then number three would be like a deep desire to understand 
uh, the ancestral messages in such a way that the desire has become a desperation. And so kind of like blocking oneself by being so like, I want to know, I want to know, I want to know, and like not being able to relax uh, to be able to see what's already there. Thank you. And then as I guess to, um, as a solution to that, would you recommend that at that point, because those are three big things that you hear often, at that point people go and look for a dream worker or um, again, start with that clearing and cleansing. We already talked about the first step, but is, yeah, with those things in mind, if you're struggling with that, is the solution to go to a dream worker? Because it doesn't sound like work you can really do individually, like alone. Right, right. Yeah. And like like I said before, you know, dreams are generally shared with family. So you have like all of these people around you to help work through it. And I generally also teach in cohorts. So there is like a group of people for folks to talk to. Um, and yeah, you know, as, at some point it may be helpful to have someone who can reflect back to you what's happening and also help you organize and like kind of discard the stuff that's not necessarily a priority or things that you like don't need anymore in general. Thank you. Um, any last like people should know this um, before we end? Yeah, dream working is really fun. Like, there's a lot to be aware of and be protective of and stuff, but it's also, like, really fun and this very, like, sexy, powerful, childlike, kindergartner, imaginative way. Like, dream working is so fun, and I'm so, I feel so blessed to be able to offer this medicine to others. No, that's awesome. Yeah, it does sound like fun. It also sounds, like, scary and exciting and just, like, something um, life-giving, which we need more of because our lives get taken away. Yeah. Um, thank you so much. This is great. I learned a lot. I hope other people learn something. Um, I think when it comes to this particular kind of work, like you said before, spending with the family and just being able to have the safe spot or a safe brain to uh, lay some of your ideas seems like um, most important. So um, thank you for your work and being a kind of person that people can come to to do that. Really appreciate it um, for the world at large. <laughs> um, so we're going to end with our outro lullaby. And this is probably part two. I don't know how Google Meet does it, but yeah, this might be part two that anybody is watching. Thank you for joining. Again, Tyrell, appreciate your time. Um, thank you all for listening and watching. If you have any questions or uh, anything like that, you can put them in the comments below. Subscribing helps us out a lot. So if you enjoyed this, please subscribe. Also, uh, Tyrell has an Instagram tag, cause, C-A-U-S-E dot rain, R-E-I-G-N, right? Yes. And a website. You want to plug your website? Uh, yeah, my website is www.causerain.com and that's C-A-U-S-E-R-E-I-G-N.
Your information will be down below um, this video. Thank you, everyone. Rest easy. Sweet dreams. Bye-bye. <laughs>